Welcome to the 700 Club. Today is March 22nd, and it's my father's birthday. And this is the first birthday in my life I'm celebrating for him where he's not here. Uh, about a year ago, um, three months, uh, December of 2022, he kind of surprised me. I was visiting him, and he said, let's have a birthday party. And, and, and typically, we celebrate his birthday every five years, but this was, he was going to be 93, and so he wanted a birthday party. I think he knew uh, what was coming, and I also think he wanted it. He really missed my mother, and so he, he wanted to celebrate his birthday. So in typical Robertson fashion, he wanted the Oak Ridge Boys to come, and during their concert a year ago, he asked for a special request because they said, sir, it's your birthday. Would you like us to sing any song? And he shouted out, could you <laughs> sing Elvira? And so they sang Elvira to celebrate his birthday. So today, if you could say an um papa wow mau mau, if I got that right, um papa mau mau, in honor of him, that would be wonderful, and I would certainly rejoice with you. Solomon wrote a proverb. It's in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 7. The memory of the righteous is a blessing. And in Israel today, they tell each other in memory of their departed ones, may his memory be a blessing. So anyone that you've lost in your family, think of them today, and may that memory be a blessing for you. Well, turning to Israel, Israel will fight through to victory against Hamas, even if the whole world turns against it, including the United States. That's the promise from a top Israeli government official. That pledge comes as the United Nations is set to vote today on a resolution sponsored by the United States. It calls for a ceasefire in the war in Gaza. Paul Strand has the story from Jerusalem. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is making it clear ahead of the U.N. vote that a ceasefire and hostage deal is a top concern for the U.S. There's a clear consensus around a number of shared priorities. First, the need for an immediate, sustained ceasefire with the release of hostages. While there could be a pause in the war, the feelings of hostility toward Israel remain, as new polling shows most Palestinians are still on the side of Hamas. 71% of Palestinians in Gaza and Judea and Samaria, known as the West Bank, say Hamas made the right decision to launch the attacks against Israel on October 7th. 94% think Israel has committed war crimes during their current fighting, but 91% do not think Hamas did. In fact, 93% say Hamas did not commit the atrocities seen in the videos of October 7th. But among Palestinians who have seen those videos, 17% believe Hamas fighters did commit atrocities against civilians. As the fighting continues on the ground in Gaza, Israel says it captured some 650 suspected terrorists in the military operation at the Shifa hospital this week, including top Hamas officials. Many Hamas terrorist operatives and senior ones have been hiding in the hospital. And also Islamic Jihad group has been hiding in this hospital. And Israel says it carried out the operation without any harm to civilians, even those working in the hospital. Civilians, doctors, medic teams, none have been hurt. And while Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has made clear Israel must launch an assault on the last Hamas stronghold in the city of Rafah in Gaza, Secretary of State Blinken made it clear before arriving in Israel today the U.S. does not support such an invasion. A major military operation uh, in Rafah uh, would be a mistake, something we don't support. And it's also not necessary to deal with Hamas, which is necessary. Um, we're going to have an opportunity uh, next week to uh, share in, in detail uh, that view with uh, our Israeli counterparts and uh, to lay out our views on um, how to deal with the problem differently. But Israeli Strategic Affairs Minister Ron Dermer says Israel will go into Rafah no matter who opposes it. Even if the entire world turns on Israel, including the United States, we're going to fight. Paul Strand, CBN News, Jerusalem. And they should fight. Hamas has to end. Uh, they can't live. You can't live in Israel under the threat that Hamas has said. Uh, I call it an Islamic death cult. And they have said they will repeat October 7 again and again and again and again until Israel doesn't exist anymore. Hamas cannot stay in control of the government of Gaza if, if Israel doesn't move forward here and completely eliminate them, then they're going to be under threat for years to come. 
That can't happen. It, it should never happen. Listen hard to the um, surveys of the Palestinians where they're living in, in denial of what happened on October 7th. They're also living in denial of what's happening now. To take civilians and hold them as hostages is a war crime. To use hospitals and mosques and churches and residential homes as cover for your military operations, that again is a war crime. These aren't being talked about in the news media, certainly not being talked about in the Palestinian territories, but we need to talk about it and we need to let our voice be heard. So please today, call your representative in Congress, call your senator, let them know, let, let them know how you feel and how you want them to support Israel. Israel is in a battle for its existence and they need to know the United States of America is standing strong with them. There's a lot of politics going on. There's a lot of uh, attempts to try to appeal to voters in Michigan, Muslim voters in Michigan. All of these things are happening. In that, we need to let our voice be heard. So let's put that number back on the screen. Call 202-224-3121. Now's the time to say we stand with Israel. We need to support Israel. We need to be with them in their time of need. I'm looking for you to vote for packages to help Israel in this conflict. Do it now. Again, let's get this number up. I want to say it again, 202-224-3121. In other news, more Americans are being airlifted out of Haiti as the gang, of, gang violence there intensifies. And it's wonderful that the U.S. government's finally getting engaged to rescue Americans. Ephraim Graham has that story from the CBN Newsroom. Ephraim? Gordon, a spokesperson told The Voice of America the U.S. government evacuated more than 90 Americans out of the capital of Haiti Thursday, but hundreds are still trapped in the country. Wednesday, the Florida Department of Emergency Management chartered a plane that evacuated 14 Florida residents, including eight children. More than 300 Floridians are still in Haiti. Florida's Emergency Management Division is working on getting them out despite bureaucratic obstacles from the federal government and safety threats in Haiti. Thousands of orphans are among those stranded in Haiti and the U.S. Embassy is now closed, but a ministry is working to bring more than 100 of them to this country. CBN's Jenna Browder takes a look at this uphill battle. Turmoil in Haiti. The capital city of Port-au-Prince reeling from gang warfare. With life for locals growing more dangerous by the day. Among the most vulnerable, Haiti's orphans. Love Him, Love Them is one ministry on the ground trying to help. We have six different locations. We have schools, orphanages, churches. We opened a hospital in the middle of a global pandemic. And it's unbelievable. We're responsible for over 5,000 children. Founder Linda Gunter says they have dozens of children ready to come to the U.S. We have 101 children who have already been matched. They have adoptive families here in the United States. The families here in the U.S. already know the kids. The kids already know the families. And yet, because of what's happened in the last two weeks, we can't get them out. We can't get them out. The problem is paperwork. We have paid, uh, played by the rules, for lack of a better term, done everything exactly the way we're supposed to do. And yet we can't get the, that final piece of paper to get out. Why can't we get it? They closed the embassy. So we can't get into the embassy to get that final stamp. She's asking anyone who will to sign a petition with the National Council for Adoption. And if you want to take it even a step further, you can write to the U.S. State Department and your congressman here in Washington. The goal is to get the government's attention and persuade it to take action on behalf of these children. This is, we just need to make some noise. We need to make some noise. Jenna Browder, CBN News. If you'd like to sign the petition or reach out to the State Department, we've got information included in this story on our website. You can find it by visiting CBNNews.com. Turning now to a major political issue since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade last year, pro-choice advocates across the country have been hard at work trying to legalize abortion in states that banned it after the court's decision. Pro-life groups are pushing back. 
CBN contributing correspondent Paul Petit takes a closer look at what they're up against. Decline to sign is the theme of Arkansas pro-life advocates as they fight to keep a state abortion ban in place. Arkansas is the most pro-life state in the union. The only reason that a woman could get an abortion in the state of Arkansas is for a medical emergency. The goal of these rallies, keep voters from signing to add an amendment initiative to the November ballot. The amendment aims to enshrine abortion access in the state constitution. Arkansas was one of 13 states with a trigger law, which banned abortion after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in June. The Dobbs ruling allows states to decide. So far, abortion advocates have seen success in six states to make abortion legal again through the voting process. In 2024, there are efforts in as many as 13. The key thing to know about these uh, ballot initiatives all across the country is that they permanently change state constitutions. Your elected officials cannot go back and reverse the effects of these abortion amendments should they make it into your state constitution. 90,000 signatures must be gathered by July 5th to get the measure on the Arkansas November ballot. Local abortion advocates are confident they'll reach that number. We have momentum on our side, so Ohio, Kansas, um, Kentucky with the governor's race, Michigan, all of these states give us hope that through the direct action of people, uh, we can restore some access for abortion services in this state. This is a great amendment for people who have nuanced views or might identify as more in the middle. According to Arkansas pro-life groups, what abortion advocates are not telling people at these signature drives is how their efforts, if successful, will open the floodgates to abortion on demand at places like this and throughout Arkansas. It's an extremely deceptive amendment. They want abortion legal for any reason up to 18 weeks, which is basically 20 weeks for the baby. And then after that, it would be for, in the exception of rape, incest, or the health of the mother. And health can be defined as I'm feeling depressed. And, and the definition of health is by the abortionist. How do you think that women or any voter who believes that abortion should be allowed if the mother's life at risk how do you think they would respond if they knew the real language? If they knew that this law will make null and void all of the pro-life laws in the state of Arkansas, that means no parental consent for minors. That means no health inspections on the abortion centers. If they knew the full extent, the extreme nature of this amendment, they would be against it. In an effort to keep the measure off the ballot, Arkansas pro-life organizations, churches, legislators, and citizens are joining forces to educate and mobilize. In a matter of a week and a half, members from the Arkansas Coalition for Life, or NWA Coalition for Life, had gone to over 300 churches in the Northwest Arkansas area. And so we've taken that strategy and we've started doing it all across the state. Pro-life advocates say they'll continue the fight to ensure abortion access that voters approved in other states doesn't happen in Arkansas. It's so important that we win. It is a life or death situation. In Arkansas, Paul Petit, CBN News. That battle in Arkansas is likely what we're going to see play out in state after state across the country. Gordon? Yes, and welcome to Messy Democracy. Uh, and this is the the, the consequence of, of Roe v. Wade being overturned. I, I obviously applaud that. I'm pro-life. But now we're into how does each state determine their laws. And so it's up to us in the pro-life community to get involved and, more importantly, stay involved. Don't think that the battle's been won. It hasn't. We're now into the messy part of it, which is how are states going to determine their laws on abortion. But I would encourage you to stay involved even after the legislation, because we need a culture that supports mothers. Uh, we need a, a culture that su supports children. Uh, if you're facing economic uncertainty because you're pregnant, well, we need to come alongside you and say, no, you, no, there's no uncertainty here. We're here for you. We want to help you. We want to encourage life, and we want to support life. So this is more than just legislation. It's more than just legal battles. It's a battle for mothers, and how can we help them as a culture and as a society? So be dedicated to life and not just for uh, short term bursts, but depending on constitutional amendments or current legislation, uh, get involved. There are plenty of crisis pregnancy centers. There are plenty of areas where you can get involved financially. You can volunteer your time. 
But most importantly, mothers in America need to know we stand with them and we're with them all the way through. Well, for some, and this is unbelievable to me, for some, the b brutal terrorist attack on October 7th has been forgotten. Others deny, well, that attack never happened. A group of government leaders from around the world believe it's important to keep the memory alive. They traveled to the sites where some of the attacks took place to see for themselves the undeniable evidence. Chris Mitchell brings us that story. Members of parliament from more than 20 nations came here to the heart of Kafar Aza to see for themselves firsthand the destruction from October 7th. Today we have the largest delegation of members of parliament around the world since October 7th. The, the importance is not just to educate them on what actually happened here so they can see it for themselves. Josh Reinstein, president of the Israel Allies Foundation, organized the visit. Well, these parliamentarians aren't just members of parliament. They're actually chairman of caucuses of many groups of members of parliament in their home countries. We have 53 Israel allies caucuses. 21 of them are actually presented here today. These people represent hundreds and even thousands of people who support Israel. So it's important for them to understand so they can go back to their parliaments and explain to their colleagues as well. The experience made a powerful impression. It's terrible. It was terrible to read what the terrorist organization did here. This is a reaction of shock and realizing how brutal these people, do they, are they called people, can be. And it's something which is not acceptable. We cannot remain without any move, without any steps to change the situation. But the main problem is in their head and in their hearts. So it's not a problem so much of uh, military power. And I think something has to be done with the way of thinking. And this is the thing we need to address, because these people can repeat such a deeds again. And as we have heard the leaders of Hamas, they promised to do it again. Yeah. So this is not something we can allow, and we need to change the way of thinking. The group signed a resolution calling for the end of UNRWA, the UN agency found to be filled with Hamas terrorists. I feel a terrible betrayal because these people were supposed to help. This was an international body and they simply lied to people who commissioned them to help the hostages. This is a terrible deceit. When the war has gone on and we can see also that civilians always suffer in, in during the war time, we understand that we need some kind of organization taking care of the humanitarian aid. And this is what the international community would have to decide on. What type of organization could be more useful than UNRWA has been until now? Member of Knesset Sharon Haskell addressed the group and explained why their visit is so important. We see such a mass denial from social media and some, you know, uh, mainstream full media. But what had actually happened here, those representatives who came here to see through their own eyes what we've actually experienced here, one of the worst butcher and, and massacre that Israel had ever experienced in its history, is critical. I mean, they see the evidence, they feel it, they understand it, and no one can deny that. Haskell says Israel is fighting on the front lines of the battle facing the world. What we're fighting here, it's not a territorial war. This is not a Russian-Ukrainian war. This is a war on our values. This is a war against radical Islam. I mean, they had their territory. They didn't fight for that. They are fighting for the complete annihilation of the state of Israel and butchering and massacring every single living Jew. You need to understand, this, this land is the front gate. I mean, we're fighting this war that the rest of the world might be behind. I mean, it's creeping in, but we are literally fighting on our identity, on our values, on democracy, on liberties, freedom, women's rights, freedom of speech, equality. That's what we're really fighting for. And this is a fight and a war that the rest of the world has to join forces together because it doesn't stop in Israel. It's already in Europe in North America, Central and South America, it's everywhere, it's spreading. And wherever there's evil, we have to stand and be very, very clear about it, that there's zero tolerance towards it. 
Reinstein says Christian support is vital during this dark time in Israel's history. It's Christians, not countries that are standing with Israel. What makes this a, a, a very special event is that these people are all men and women of faith. These are Christian legislators who take their biblical support and turn to real political action. We call that faith-based diplomacy. And that's what's unique about this conference, that so many members of parliament from around the world have come together uh, as people of faith to stand with Israel. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Kafar Aza, Israel. Now more than ever, we need to let people know we stand with Israel, and we need to let our elected officials know that we stand with Israel. We need to let Israel know we will never forget October 7th. It's never going to leave our memories. What happened there was absolutely horrific. It was intentionally targeting civilians. It was intentionally, in that kibbutz, Kafar Aza, which is Hebrew for town of Gaza. It's right across. You, you literally, from the uh, fence of the kibbutz, you can see Gaza. They were the, the Israelis who were reaching out to Palestinians in Gaza, wanting to help them, wanting to have peace, wanting to employ them. As a result, the terrorists knew exactly where to go. Who did they target? They targeted the young people area of that kibbutz. This is where young people in their 20s were living. And that devastation you saw was all targeted to wipe out a future generation. That's what they were trying to do. They were trying to humiliate them. They killed in the first couple of houses. I spoke with the brother of Savan who, who was killed. She's just 23 years old. Her whole life ahead of her is all taken away by these terrorists. And then the rest of that group was kidnapped and are still being held hostages. This isn't something long ago. The atrocity is still happening today. They're being imprisoned in dark tunnels in Gaza. Now, anyone that wants to say October 7th was justified because Israel is an occupying power, you do not know the facts. Israel wasn't occupying Gaza at all. Gaza was under Hamas. That was the government of Gaza. IDF wasn't in Gaza. There wasn't anything to do with Gaza. Israel was occupying Israel, which is a nation recognized by the UN, by the world community, and by the United States of America. To say it's an illegal occupation, you're going against international law. Let's make sure you know the facts and you know the history and you can stand up to this horrible propaganda that's being put out. The war crime is on Hamas. It's not on Israel. As long as Hamas still holds the hostages, as long as they threaten Israel, Israel has every right to defend itself, to get its citizens back home to do these things, whatever is necessary to say, Hamas, you can't exist anymore. So I'll call for that number again. Please let your senators and your representative in Congress know how you feel. Call them today. The, the, the vote is, uh, is going to be ongoing, but you need to let them know. 202-224-3121. You're counting on them to stand with Israel. Terry? Philip's body was shutting down. He needed multiple organ transplants. As Philip was staring at the end of his life, he cried out to God. Then, he says, God reminded him that he had already died once. Weird things started happening. My eyes turned yellow. I was constantly tired all the time. I started dropping weight. It sent me into fear. This is the end of your life. Philip Hanks valued strength more than anything. A bodybuilder since he was 13, his focus was always to get that much bigger, more cut. But at 34, years of excessive supplement use had damaged his liver, and a supposedly sterilized tattoo needle was the final straw. And when I went and seen the doctor, they ran blood work, and that re-sterilized needle had hepatitis C in it. You have liver cancer, and you're gonna need a liver transplant. It shocked me. It, I have never even had a broken bone, let alone any kind of surgery or anything else. The next thought I had was, you don't want to drag someone through all of that medical stuff. So I began trying to break off the uh, relationship with my then girlfriend. I loved him. It was never a question as, as far as I was concerned that I wasn't going to be 
there for the storm. Whenever there is something that's happening to me, I always call on Jesus. So I just kind of held on to that and asked for God to heal him and cover him. And that's when I decided this is, this is the woman I have to marry. Philip and Tiva exchanged vows shortly after, and from then on were joined in prayer. A few months later, they got the call. A liver was ready. As he was put under for the surgery, Philip had one more word with God. Okay, God, you know, if this goes wrong, I want to come to you. Due to complications, Philip flatlined on the operating table. I was part of light, the brightest light you could possibly imagine. I remember being filled with overwhelming love, peace, joy, excitement. I would think I was in the outer realms of heaven. And I heard audibly, it's not your time. You have to go back. You're going to be okay. It took three and a half minutes to resuscitate him. After two follow-up surgeries and a painful recovery, the transplant was deemed a success. He went on to live normally for nearly 13 years until one day he felt a shooting pain while playing basketball. Doctors discovered that Philip's transplanted liver was failing, requiring another transplant and also a new kidney. He was then sent to a specialist in multi-organ transplants at Indiana University Health, Dr. Richard Mangus. The news he had for Philip was disheartening. We're gonna have to remove your liver, kidney, pancreas, upper and lower intestines, and your stomach, and we're gonna have to replace them. He didn't know if it was going to work, and then I said, well, do you have a restroom? And I'm crying, and I'm blubbering, and I'm down on my hands and knees. And I remember looking up, and I was kind of yelling at God, and I was like, so this is it? This is how I go out? And then I was reminded, you died for three and a half minutes. I've been with you all this time, why would I leave you now? And then that calm that I felt when I was in the hospital room and what I felt when I was in the light it came back over me. And I was like, OK, all right. Well, I was very upfront with him and told him I didn't want to do the transplant. Well, in the end, Philip changed my mind. You know, some people get so sick, and, and in their mind and in their attitude, they're defeated. And Philip wasn't like that. He, he felt like that we could do this. And I think that that gives some small bit of confidence to the surgeon, like, I, I can work with this person. Once a donor was eventually found, Tiva rallied family and friends to lift Philip up in prayer. Dr. Mangus performed two extensive surgeries, transplanting the five organs over the course of two days. The results were astounding. You know, I tell patients, uh, you're going to be in the hospital at least a month. Oftentimes, most of that is in the ICU, and Philip, uh, you know, within days, he was up and, and around and starting to walk. I think it's remarkable. It was amazing. It was amazing. Philip is here because prayer moves mountains. Philip rejoined his family and has since felt healthier and happier than ever before. He began working with the Illinois Secretary of State to promote organ donation. He speaks at events and high schools, telling everyone he can how God and the power of prayer saved his life. Dr. Mangus agrees. It's inspiring to see someone like him. I think faith can have a very large part in, in making it through any kind of a health issue. Everything that we do is, is came from God. Uh, you know, my patients tell me often that uh, everyone's praying for them, they're praying for me, and I say thank you very much. I will take all the help that I can get because I need it. I can't put into words how grateful I am for the donation. God is real, heaven is real, and prayer works. I cannot count on one hand how many times God has blessed me over and over and over again. And I'm nobody special. If you call on him, he will come. You know what's remarkable about this story is Philip was a guy who didn't have any problems before. Life is so full of suddenlies, isn't it? And here he is needing five organ transplants and experiencing uh, really being in the outer realms of heaven and then calling upon the name of the Lord again and God reiterating to him how faithful he is. I don't know what you're experiencing today, but I hope you take that message to heart. God is faithful. He knows you by name. I always love the scripture where it says, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. God gets you. You know, he's right there with you. Now, 
focus on his presence in your life and we want to take some time to pray with you and for you for whatever it is you're experiencing right now this is deborah she wrote in and said she'd struggled with problems with her vision she had to keep rubbing her eyes just to see clearly then gordon she heard you say there's someone who has a detached retina in the left eye god is healing that for you in jesus name she immediately felt her eye get stronger saw her vision improve and she knew that god had healed her eyes Sight. Praise the Amen. Lord. <laughs> Amen. God wants to heal you. He wants to support you. He wants to be with you. He wants to be your miracle worker. Listen to what Philip said, the peace that came on him, the light. When he was in the presence of Jesus, everything was possible. All you have to do to get to that realm is to get to Jesus. So let's do that. How do you get to him? Well, you pray and you ask him to come in. Whenever two or more are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Terry and I will be your two or more. Jesus will show up for you. So let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we come to you and we ask that your presence would be with us, that it would overwhelm us, that we would know that in you we live and move and have our being. Jesus, be above us, be below us, be to our right and to our left, be in front of us, be behind us, and most importantly, be in us. We invite you in that we would be a vessel for your glory. Now, we ask for our disease now, and we declare that these things have happened to us so that your glory would be revealed. Reveal your glory in healing, Lord God. Reveal it now in Jesus' name. There's someone you have a severe lung infection that's painful just to take a breath. In the name of Jesus, may all that inflammation, all that infection leave you right now. Take a deep breath. It doesn't hurt anymore. Take a deep breath and realize that sweet peace has come to you. You're healed now in Jesus' name. Terry? There's someone, you have an issue with the um, frontal lobe of your brain, and uh, it's of great concern, might even need some surgery. God is healing that for you right now. All of the projected problems with that, all of the, even the things that you have seen, gone now in Jesus' name as he makes you completely whole. Now, there's someone, you have severe sinus infection, um, it, it's like your, your, your head is heavy and it leans forward and you're, and you're in so much pain. God is healing you of all of that and he's restoring your sinuses. Everything is going to be normal now. Someone else, you have a curvature of the spine between your shoulders. God's able to straighten that for you. He's doing it now. You, what you couldn't do before, lift both of your hands, turn your back, twist everything, realize... Yes, everything's back in place. Everything is wonderful for you right now. As someone else, you're experiencing like a, a, a breakdown in the muscle fiber of your legs, and it's really hindered you. The way you'll know this is you, is you, you ride your bike. I mean, I think you race with your bike, and you've not been able to do that. God's healing that for you right now. Just begin to stand up and praise him and thank him for what he's doing. You're being restored. Uh, there's someone you got a severe shoulder injury. It's from a blow to the shoulder. God is healing. He's knitting it back together for you. In the name of Jesus, be healed and be made whole. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are the miracle worker, that what you did 2,000 years ago, you're still doing today. We thank you for it. We glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you've been touched by God, let us know. Well, call us, 1-800-700-7000, so we can share your good report. And if you need prayer, we believe in prevailing prayer. That's the prayer that doesn't give up until you get an answer. So we'll stand with you in prayer. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN news break. We take you now to Washington for an honor for wartime service of American military units known as the Ghost Army. It came in a ceremony Thursday at the U.S. Capitol. 
These special soldiers received the Congressional Gold Medal in recognition of their unique and distinguished sacrifice. For decades, their World War II mission was a secret, using innovative tactics to trick Nazis. House Speaker Mike Johnson highlighted their hidden life-saving heroism. Because of the courageous work of this group, it is estimated that 15 to 30,000 lives were saved. Three of the seven known surviving members of the Ghost Army attended the ceremony. CBN's Operation Blessing is providing homes for those in need around the world. In Peru, Riquel May is a single father of six. He had to leave his restaurant job to care for his children when his partner abandoned the family. He did odd jobs, odd jobs to feed his hungry children, and he invested in a small business selling corn tamales. But poor sales made the family's bad situation even worse. Harsh winds and heavy rains took their toll on his decaying wooden house. When Operation Blessing heard about the situation, teams went to work to build the family a new house. They then gave Raquel May everything he needed to succeed in his tamale business, including a gas stove, grain grinding machine, and more. He and his children are now well fed, and he thanks God and the friends who donated to his business. You can learn more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. Well, high up in the mountains of Peru, water is scarce. In some places, the only source is a dirty, smelly hole in the ground. People like 12-year-old Maria are so desperate, they have to drink it. 12-year-old Maria lives with her family in the Andes Mountains of Peru, more than 13,000 feet above sea level. Her father provides for them by farming and raising cows. But their biggest challenge is finding clean water to drink. I go to collect water in large bottles. It is so difficult and tiring, and the water is not clean or treated. It smells. Their main source of drinking water is this hole in the ground which collects rainwater. It's contaminated due to exposure. When it dries up, they have to find other water sources. Maria's dad, Vincente, said he sees his children get sick a lot from the bad water, and worries that their lives might be in danger. My daughters always get diarrhea. I am afraid they might get really sick, so we take them to the health clinic. Then I have to find money to pay for medicine. But as their dad, I will do anything to help them. Then Operation Blessing came to the community to build a new water system. We found a water source and ran a pipe to a large elevated tank where the water is treated. Then, using solar power, we delivered clean drinking water to homes around the area. Thanks to Operation Blessing, the water is close to my house. I feel very proud to have this system. I am not afraid for my daughters any longer. Now I can cook, wash, and have cold water to drink. Thank you. Well, today is World Water Day, and we want to encourage you to think of others who don't have fresh water. In our homes, we can go to the faucet, and we have potable water, and we get upset if the water's not on, uh, and if there's something wrong with it, or it's not coming out the right color, uh, you're going to hear a big complaint come up. Uh, and for most people, uh, and it is most people around the world, access to water is an iffy thing. Uh, I've lived in the villages of, of India. I shouldn't say I lived. I, I visited for a month. And in there, it, you had to go to the village well to get water. If you wanted a hot shower, you had to put your bucket in the sun. Uh, so I know what it's like, and I know the amount of time that people have to take in order to get drinking water, just to wash their clothes, prepare meals, uh, do what's necessary to life. So according to the U.N., more than 2 billion people lack, lack access to safe water. So Operation Blessing is working throughout the year to provide safe sources to communities in need. We've gone to these water programs now where we adopt whole communities. It costs more money uh, from anywhere from $35,000 to $70,000 per water system, but you help so many people when you do that, and it makes it easier to maintain 
makes it easier to check for potability. All of these, these things are, are wonderful things where you can transform a community. You can help this effort by supporting our clean water program. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000, or you can visit ob.org slash waterday24, or you can text waterday24 to 71777. Either way, do it right now. You can call us, 1-800-700-7000. Say yes, you can count on me on World Water Day. Terry? Well, for the third time in four years, Bryce Drew is taking the Grand Canyon Antelopes to the NCAA tournament. The veteran head coach has also led two other teams to the postseason. And 25 years ago, he nailed a buzzer beater that's still showcased in match match. March Madness, say that twice fast, highlight reels. Well, recently, Coach Drew met with sports reporter Tom Buring, and he shared how he handles the pressures of being on the big stage. Bryce Drew holds court on a campus of distinction. We're the world's largest Christian university. That doesn't happen without God's hand and, and, and blessing. Previously leading two different schools to the NCAA tournament, Bryce made it three as Grand Canyon University's head basketball coach. We want to be an extension of the school, implement faith into our players, play hard, and, and hopefully win a lot of games. The two-time conference champions have. For that same Bryce Drew that once hit that iconic game-winning shot, catapulting Valparaiso to a 1998 tournament upset while his dad and brother watched as coaches. My momentum was carrying me forward, so by the time I landed, I was a lot closer to the three-point line. Just reacting, you know, it was all like, like a blur, how quick it happened. And if you look, the ball like skims the front of the rim and skids in. Um, and I was like, oh man, like I really like thought it was gonna be short and it almost was. 25 years later, can you believe all that's happened? No, I can't even get the ball that far now, so <laughs> I'm, I'm glad it went in. After six seasons as an NBA player and 11 as a college coach, Bryce merges the core of each together. Are you by nature a builder? I was really competitive as, as an athlete, and so my nature is just do it harder, do it more. Early in my coaching days, I kind of just had that approach on about everyone on the team. And now as I've gotten to coach a lot of different personalities, I think some people really respond to that. And then others probably need, you know, a lot more encouragement. And a lot of now you have to answer why, you know, why am I doing this coach? And, and that's just become part of our coaching. So they know what's expected sooner than later. Bryce, your heart to coach day in and day out. What is the one thing that you keep going back to? You know, growing up a coach's kid and loving the game, I was always in the gym. Definitely the blueprint that my dad laid out years ago. Big job as a coach is the influence we're going to have on basketball players. Some people we can just go out and speak why we live the way we do, and others it's an example from a face perspective. It's from a, a character perspective. They'll look back, you know, 20, 30 years and be like, man, like that really changed my life. Most common pressing need those incoming freshmen have. Most of, you know, the, the young men on our team, they want to be able to trust us as coaches and trust us as men. And that doesn't happen overnight. It's something, you know, that we have to earn on a year-to-year on -year basis. You can build trust for a lifetime and you can lose it in one moment. And so for us as coaches is to build that trust, but then even harder, you know, to keep that trust. What is required more from you now as a head coach that you didn't have to bring 10 years ago? And you have to have a great administration, willing to adapt. And then, you know, assistant coaches, I think, are more valuable now than ever, just with building relationships with players, you know, with the portal being able to leave right away to a different school. It definitely changes a long-term perspective in a program, more to a short-term perspective. You're gonna get a lot of players that just coming for one year, coming for two years. And so a lot of that process with culture, team building, character building, needs to be accelerated a little bit faster than the past. How do you prevent the message from a Christian university that can quickly become obligated, stale, and instead fanning that to a group of individuals in need of some foundations in their life? I'm a work in progress. You know, how we present the gospel is a work in progress. I've tried to get better at that. And the Bible is how clever, you know, Jesus was getting his message across. And sometimes it was through, you know, the parables or time and place, I think, is so important. What's most important about learning how to lose mm. in order to learn how to win? 
Is there a relationship there? Yeah, as an athlete, as a coach, I've always learned way more through losing, unfortunately. Those losses have motivated me. It's painful and you hate it, but sometimes in my lowest sports moments, unbelievable moments have come from that. You know, after you do experience the setbacks and the growing pains and, and then the improvement, it makes it that much uh, more meaningful when you do get to reach your goals. The performance of the demand and the pressure to win. You know, there's a lot of things, unfortunately, that, that you just can't control. It's always that balance of, okay, God, you know, this is yours. You know, you want to win and you want to be successful and you want your, your guys to, to, to enjoy their experience there and just what the sports world is. And it's, it's something that you have to grow and learn to handle. Does the competitor part of us conflict or complement the Christ within us? I need to give my all at what I'm doing. And if it's to win a game, I give my all to try to win that game. I don't think you can be two different people. All of a sudden you're following Christ outside the lines and you're not following Christ inside the lines. Christ was very ambitious in getting his gospel out, but he never overstepped what God wants him to do today. I want to be able to win knowing that I'm staying true to the Lord and true to how I profess to live my life. Do you have a tendency to apply the competitor in you in your devotion in following him? Um, as we all know, you know, life is hard. There's so many challenges and things thrown at you. Just like a game, at times all the shots are going in and, and then all of a sudden they don't go in, their team makes it and you gotta, you know, rear up those competitive juices again. And I would say very similar to the Christian faith. It's easier to be a non-follower of Christ. It's much harder to be a follower of Christ. And at that point, you know, we leave it in God's hands and, and just go out and perform, you know, what he's blessed us to be able to do. Coach Bryce Drew, and boy, what what a sense of urgency as a player, and then to go on as the coach. I don't know which has the greater pressure on it. I think coaching does because yeah. you're responsible for the people on the team. Yeah. You're, you're discipling them. You're bringing them up. Congratulations to Grand Canyon. Here, here. Uh, the largest Christian university, I think, in the world, I know, in America. And it's, it's wonderful what they're doing and how successful they are. Well, here's a word from Psalms. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon you, for you will answer me. Be assured, God will answer your prayer. Call to him today. God bless. We'll see you again.